Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now what we see here in Revelation 14 is a unique picture. It is a, a vision. And the hard part for us when we approach a book like the book of Revelation is um, we, we think in a linear way. In the West, that's the way we think. We want things to be in order. And these things are in order, meaning they are structured. They are, they are um, laid out for us in a way that makes sense. The problem is it doesn't necessarily fit our culture. So remember, John is writing to, to an audience that is really mixed. It's Western in the sense that there is Greek thought, but it's also um, the Orient, so to speak, in the sense that you're speaking about Eastern thought. And so both of these are really mixed together. And so in many ways, Revelation sometimes comes across like it's going back and forth between time domains. And the reality is this, sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes the book of Revelation is actually talking about things that have happened in the past, like, for example, the fall of Satan. But some things that are being discussed are things that are yet to come, the end of all things. But some of the things that John is writing are things that are taking place in his time. The same thing is true for us as we read the book of Revelation, meaning some of the things that we're reading about happened in the past, like, for example, the fact that John had a vision on the island of Patmos. But also, there are things that are yet to come, the end of all things. And some of the things that are being spoken of are things that pertain to us today. And such is the case as we approach here, Revelation 14. You see, these 144,000 are not dead and now in heaven before the throne of God. The 144,000 are spoken of here in a vision. And John is talking about these group of people, 144,000, who will be empowered by the Holy Spirit, 144,000 who will be used by God in a radical way, 144,000 witnesses who will share the gospel during the tribulation, and through them will come the greatest revival the world has ever seen. These are 144,000 people who will be used by God in such a dynamic way, they will be used in a way that no one in the history of the world has ever been used. These will be sealed, according to Revelation 7, meaning this, they will be protected, and they will live through the tribulation period, and though people will come after them, though there might be assassins sent out to kill them, they will prevail, every single one of them. They will live through the tribulation. More importantly, they will thrive through it. And they will be used by God in a radical way. And for us, they become a powerful picture of what the church could be now. How we could be used. How we could reach our community for Jesus Christ. How the things that we do could have an impact on the world if we're willing. If we're willing to be men and women that are fully surrendered to God. Back in World War II, many of you know that the Nazis did many different experiments on those that they had, they had captured or those that they had imprisoned. And in certain concentration camps, one of the things that they would do is they would have the Jews that were held captive there who were being tortured and, of course, exterminated, they would have them dig holes. And as they would have them dig holes, they would have them pile the dirt and then move the dirt from one part of the camp to the other. And after they moved it to one part to the other, they would fill up another hole, have them dig another hole, and move dirt from one part to another. Now, of course, it takes time to dig a hole. It takes time to, to 
pile up the dirt. It takes time to move the dirt from one place to another into neat piles. And they kept doing this over and over and over again. And here's what they discovered. They discovered that people lost hope when they had no purpose. When they had work and they understood they had a task, even though they were being forced to do it, they sang. They sang, they talked, there was life. But when they understood they were being messed around with, when they understood that it was all a game, when they understood it was an experiment, there was no more singing. There was no more talking. They began to lose hope. They lost heart. They became depressed. And, of course, their function reduced. They gave up. The same is true for us. The reality is when we lack purpose, it's like torture. Inside, we feel like we're less than. Inside, we feel like we're made for something more, but you can't see it. You can't touch it, let alone grab a hold of it. God does not intend that our life would be that way. He intends our life would be much, much more full. He wants us to have a a powerful, a radical, an amazing, an uncommon Christian life. But the reality is, is that many believers settle for less. Turn your Bibles over to the book of Isaiah, please. Mark your place here in Revelation, but turn to Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah chapter 43. You see, every single one of us has been created by God. God has made us. He's fashioned us. The Bible tells us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, O Lord, my soul knows very well. Meaning we know that God's works are amazing, and we have been created for a purpose. We've been fashioned, the Bible says. What it means literally is that we have been woven together, woven together like a beautiful tapestry. And so we're not just made for a specific purpose. We're also made to have a specific purpose in a specific way. He's, he's woven into us all his creativity, how tall you are, how short you are, how much hair you have, how much hair you don't, right? All of these things are made for a purpose. Every single thing, the way you speak, the way you sing, your sense of humor, if you're funny, right? your seriousness, if you're not, okay? your ability to play music, your ability to teach, your ability to lead, whatever the thing is that you have, whoever you are, God has made you that way for a specific purpose. And he wants you to use your purpose, if you will, in a specific way. Isaiah 43, verse 7 says this, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. Notice again, Isaiah 43, verse 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. God has made every single one of us, and I believe without a shadow of a doubt, that God has created every single one of us with a God-given purpose by which we can glorify God. We can glorify God in the purpose that he's given us. Now, every one of us are called to preach the gospel. He's called us to be saved, and then, of course, to share the gospel to other people so they can get saved too. But how we do that and the life that we live or the vocation we have becomes a vehicle, of course, for us to be able to share the gospel. What does that mean? If you're a police officer in this room, your mission field is with fellow police officers and people who you pursue, right? Who might become a captive audience. Okay. chained, as it were, to your words, okay. arrested by your conviction. Okay. And these are people that, of course, are there, placed right in front of you as divine appointments. Okay. If you're a school teacher, okay, then your mission field is a group of minds that are young, that are fertile ground, some like blank slates, some like really blank slates, okay? And you can pour into them. You can invest in them lessons, not just about math or science or English. 
you can invest in them lessons about life. And you can have an impact on them that lasts for the rest of their days. If you're a construction worker, then you have a mission field. And it's a wonderful mission field with a group of people who are focused on doing, who care a lot about how faithful you are. And as they watch your character and they see that you're genuine, they'll ask what makes you different. They'll ask why you have peace or why you have joy. And you can share with them. You can communicate the message. Each one of us, when we leave here today, will go home and do whatever it is that we do on a Sunday. And tomorrow, perhaps, we wake up in the morning and we go off to work. And you might think, well, my focus is my job, whatever that might be. You work retail. You work with computers. You work with your hands. Whatever it might be that you do. That's my job, and I, and I punch in at 9, and I finish at 5. You're like, that's not my job. I get up when it's dark, and I get to the site when it's still dark, right? and I work all throughout the day, right? Maybe so. Some of you say, well, that's not my job. I do work swing shifts. Right? But listen, your job is not what you think your job is. Your job is just what you do for a living. Your job, your purpose is to glorify God. So you glorify God with your badge. You glorify God with a writing utensil. You glorify God with your computer. You glorify God with your tools. You glorify God with your voice. You glorify God with whatever you do. And those things become the vehicle by which God opens the door for you to share about what he did in your life. Meaning every single person in this room that claims Jesus Christ, you are preachers, you are missionaries. You are those that reach out into a world that is sick in sin, that is lost and trapped in darkness. Your job, that's what you do so you can eat. That's it. Every one of us is in full-time ministry. Amen? Every one of us. And we're called to have a passion, have compassion on a world that is lost in sin. Again, his word says, everyone who's called by my name, who I have created for my glory, I have formed him. Yes, I have made him. When we understand this, that we have been made by God and we have been made with a purpose to glorify him. When we understand that, we can have a full life and we won't be like many Christians who just simply exist. I think you know what I mean. There are a lot of people who just simply exist. You wake up, you do what you do, you go to bed. You wake up, you do what you do, you go to bed. You wake up, you do what you do, you go to bed. You wake up, you do what you do, and you go to bed. That is not life. Our lives are intended to be life and that more abundantly. We are not simply given the blessing of existing. We're given the blessing of being able to glorify the God of heaven in everything we do. So there's a fullness in the life that we've been given. And God uses us in a way that is radical. Listen, no one plans to have an average life. No one. But not everyone plans to have an uncommon one. What do you want? I mean, do you want an average life? I don't think anybody in this room would raise their hand and say, I want an average life. Do you want an uncommon life? Think about that for a moment. Do you want an uncommon life? A life that is different than the lives of people all around. Listen, when you go through the Bible and you look at at all these different lives that you see, I mean, you you notice that right from the very beginning, of course, you have Adam and Eve. They stand out. They're the only people on planet Earth. So they're uncommon. But then there's a whole period of time from chapter 1 all the way through chapter 5 that there's just people That's it. There's just people, five chapters of people 
and there's nothing. And then all of a sudden, there's a guy named Noah, and it says, and Noah found grace in the sight of God. And you're like, wow, there's a guy that stands out. And what happens after him? There's a lot of people. And then there's just nothing. And then all of a sudden, there's a person that stands out named Abram. And in his generation, there's a lot of people, but Abram's different. He's referred to as the friend of God. And then all of a sudden, there's Isaac. And this story goes on throughout the scripture that you just see there's periods of times where there's people. And then all of a sudden, there's somebody that stands out, and it gets to a point where you read a genealogy, and it lists this certain group of people, and it says, and so-and-so begot so-and-so and had many sons, and so-and-so begot so-and-so and had begun many sons, and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, and then it says, and Jabez. And it just says, and Jabez. And there's almost like this breath, like, yeah. Because when you're looking through and you're seeing all these different lives, they came, they died, they're forgotten. They came, they died, they're forgotten. They came, they died, they're forgotten. And then, and Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And he said, Lord, bless me indeed. Put your hand upon me. Enlarge my borders. Keep me from evil so they don't cause pain. And then it says this, and God granted him what he requested. Do you remember what happens afterwards? It says, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so, and so-and-so begot so-and-so. Do you want to be a so-and-so? Or would you rather be a Jabez? Who would rather be a Jabez? I would rather be a Jabez than a so-and-so. And I'd rather be a Jabez and have Jabez's than have a bunch of so-and-so's. But that means there's something that has to change. There's something that has to be different if that's going to happen. These 144,000 people were not so-and-sos. We don't know one of their names, but we know what they did. They literally changed the world for Jesus Christ. God had his hand on them, and God blessed them in a radical way. And so there's something about them that I want to learn. There's something about them that I want to be like. John Phillips, the commentator, wrote this about them. He said, they are a veritable army of militant believers marching unscathed through every form of danger. It has been theirs to defy the dragon. Their calling has been to preach the gospel, true witnesses of God in the most terrible era of the history of mankind. The devil knows about this coming band of conquerors and writhes already in an agony of anticipation. Wow. I love that. Imagine that. The devil knows that these 144,000 are coming, and even now, he claims he writhes in anticipation as he agonizes, understanding what their coming means to him. Does the devil know your name? Think about that. Does he know your name? You'd want to say yes. At least there's part of you that wants to say yes. There's part of you that says, well, no. Spiritually speaking, I'd like to have a mask so he does not know my face, my name, my address, or have my credit card information. If we're here to do more than exist, he needs to know our name. Look, we came up to Utah in 2003 after years of prayer. And the reason why we came up to Utah was we had prayed for many different places. And as we prayed for all these different places, um, the Lord did not open the door for us to, to go there. And we had prayed first for Cuba. I had ministered in Cuba since 1990, and, and we had a burden for Cuba, still do. But the Lord did not open the doors for that to happen. We prayed for New York. Um, I'm a Yankee fan, and so that was my only motivation. And so I was praying that, that we could move to New York, and the Lord closed the doors of that one real quick. Um, we prayed for a city in Minneapolis. Um, I'm sorry, in Minnesota, which was really cold. 
and that was a, a lesson of faith and also of ignorance because I had no idea what I was praying for as I was praying for an area that I later found hit 50 degrees in, in the negative that year, and the Lord graciously closed those doors. And um, I prayed for a few cities in Iowa. That was the one I, I prayed for for a long time. I'd say probably over a year I prayed for different places in Iowa. And the interesting thing is I prayed for these places. Um, the, Lord, the Lord closed the doors for us, and the way the Lord closed those doors was by opening those doors for someone else. Every place we prayed for, another church was started. And I felt like, well, they're going there. We don't need to go there. And so as I prayed for all these places, different churches started. I prayed for a city called Corpus Christi, Corpus Christi, Texas, which, of course, in Latin means body of Christ. I thought, wow, what a wonderful place for a church, right? Corpus Christi, Calvary Chapel, body of Christ. So I prayed for Corpus Christi, Texas, and what happens? A church starts. Guys, every single place I prayed for, a church started within a short amount of time. And I thought, I have a church planting prayer ministry. That's it. But apparently I'm staying in California. Now, we were pastoring in California, and the ministry was going great. It was wonderful. You know, but the Lord was just moving us on. I mean, there's a lot of churches in California. There's not the same level of need that we saw in other places. And so we kept praying, and we kept praying, and there was a godly dissatisfaction. There was a, a need where we were, sure, in some degree, but there were so many people to meet that need. And we felt like we need to go to a place where there is much more need and less people willing to go. And so we kept on praying, and it led us to Alco, Nevada. Guys, I prayed for Alco, Nevada for quite some time, and we sensed that this was something that the Lord was doing. I've never seen Alco, Nevada to this day, but I prayed for Alco, Nevada. And the thing that I prayed about was I prayed that the Lord would open the door and allow us to be able to go and start a church there to minister to people who had an incredibly high divorce rate, over 80%. And to people who were dealing with all sorts of major social issues that come when you have legalized prostitution. And as we were praying for Elko, Nevada, it seemed like the door was going to open. It seemed like it was going to happen. We even had a contact there, and it was right on the edge. And then all of a sudden, I remember where I was. I was driving my car in L.A. at the time, and I heard no. And when I heard no about Elko, Nevada, I wept because I longed to go there. And then right after that, the Lord directed us to Utah. He was refining the focus. Listen, he was refining the motivation. He was building in us the heart to minister to a people that we had never met before. And Alco broke our hearts because there was a need. Listen, churches need to have an excuse to exist. We are not a social club. We're not a place to gather to teach people how to live their lives. Meaning this, we're not here to, get, to give them you know, information about how to have a good marriage or how to have a happy family or how to do your taxes or, or how to have you know, a financial budget or how to prepare your kids for college. There's all sorts of things the world has to offer to help us with those things. We are here because we're dealing with life stuff. We're here because we have access to the power the world does not understand. We have access to the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And this book is incredibly powerful. And in this book are not just things that can help your life. In this book is your life. The things in this book tell us not just how to live. It tells us how not to die. It tells us how not to go to hell. It tells us how to raise our kids to understand how essential it is that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ so that they can have the life that God's called them to, so they can be fulfilled, so they don't end up with a rope around their neck. These things are essential. And as the Lord broke our hearts for a place we still have never been to, he began to break our hearts for a place we now live in. In 2003, when we pulled the numbers, this valley was 320,000 people. This valley had a very low crime rate. 
This valley was beautiful. This valley was a very desirable place to live and frankly was the number one place to retire in the country. And this valley also happened to be home to the highest rate of abortion for people under 18. This happened to also be the valley that had more sexual domestic child abuse cases than any other valley in the country. This happened to be home to one of the highest spousal abuse rates. It happened to be home to the highest depression rate, the highest use of Prozac and medication for depression. It happened to be home to the highest use of methamphetamines. And it happened to be home to the highest use of pornography in the country, and it still is. This valley that we live in happened to be home to one of the highest suicide rates in this country and the highest suicide rate for people under 18. That's why we came. We came here because we have a message of life. We came here because we have a message that promises rest. Come unto me, all those who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, Jesus says, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you will find rest for your souls. That's the message that the Lord had given us. You see, when we came up, we realized there was so much heartache. There was so much abuse, so much rejection, so much depression, so many addictions, so many broken marriages, so many lonely people, so many suicides. This then would be the place for us to come. The Lord opened the doors. He blew the doors off the hinges, and he let us come. Put our house up on the market, sold it in one day, and the next week, we were here. And God's blessed. But it's not been easy. We came up in part because of Numbers 13 and 14, and a specific word the Lord gave me, and a quote by one of my heroes of faith, a man named C.T. Studd. Now, if that's not the name of an awesome, you know, missionary, I mean, C.T. Studd. Can you imagine if it was C.T. Wuss? You know? <laughs> You wouldn't want to have a quote from a guy like that. Okay? But C.T. Studd, yeah, you'd want to be like him. He said, some people want to live within the walls of chapel bells. I want to run a rescue mission a yard from the gates of hell. Think about those words. That sounds like the 144,000. You see, there is so much more that God wants to give us so that we can speak from experience about the goodness of our God, a God who can meet the deepest needs in the community that we live in. He can meet those needs, but he's looking for people who will take responsibility. He's looking for people who want to be used. He's looking for people who will stand up and say, I want to do something. The problem is, is that a lot of times the things that need to be done don't get done. Listen, this is a little story about four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought that anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. That's called not preaching the gospel. Right? We've been called to have an impact on the world around us, and frankly, anybody could do it, but oftentimes, everybody's talking about it or suggesting that somebody does it, and nobody does. We have the opportunity to be different. And when I look at that 144,000, I see a group of people who are very different. So what's different about the person that God uses? We're going to go through this quickly, but what's different about the person that God uses? Because I guarantee you there's something different about that person. Number one, 
Notice in verse 1, they are marked by God. Number one, they are marked by God. Notice Revelation 14.1. Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. These are marked by God. Now, Revelation 13, verses 16 through 18, describes for us the enemy's mark. The enemy has a mark that he puts on people. This, of course, is a different mark than that mark. This mark is the one that's referred to in Revelation 7, verses 2 through 4. That those who belong to God will be sealed or marked by God. The difference between these two is important because the word that is used for mark or seal in these two different passages tell us the purpose behind the mark. Revelation 13, verses 15 through 18. 16 through 18. Take a look at that one. Right there just on the other side of your page. It says here in verse 16, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. It goes on to say that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now in Gematria, there is an attempt to try to try to try to understand that letters and numbers have a correlation. And this is an ancient practice. It was something that was done a lot by, by people that were part of the occult. Now, God's word does not condone this, but there are a lot of people who want to try to calculate the mark, understanding that, that there's a, a value attached to each number, and so that you can either through multiplication or division, you can discover what the name of this person is. And so there's been an attempt to do this for a long time, people claiming that, that Hitler, for example, was 666, or Stalin was 666. And there are absolutely people today who've done that with Obama, and then, of course, do that with Trump, and now I'm sure we'll do that with Oprah, right? And so there's going to be someone that they're going to always say, well, they must be the Antichrist, and so on and so forth. The bottom line is, we don't know. It's a waste of time to do that type of stuff. And frankly, it's just not very nice to Oprah. So the bottom line is this. We don't know, but we know that one day they will know, and this mark will happen. The important part to understand for us is this. The word for mark here in Revelation 13 means to scratch or to etch as a badge of servitude. In other words, this is a mark of slavery. It is a mark of slavery. Whereas the mark that's spoken of in Revelation 7 verse 4, is completely different. That is the mark that's put on believers. And that is a signet ring. The idea is we are stamped. We are stamped as God is saying, this one is mine. And they are like me. We are identified. My wife and I have the same ring. Our kids have the same ring. In Hebrew, it says right around that ring, I know the thoughts I think toward you. And when our children become 13, we take that child out to dinner. They choose the restaurant, and we speak a word of blessing over them, and we give them their ring. Before they're 13, they don't have a ring. When they're 13, they get a ring. That does not mean that they weren't our child before. Right? And now they're fully a member of our family. That's not what it means. Okay. What it means is this. They're 13 years old. They're making some of their own decisions. It's a time of life where a lot of people give people purity rings, saying, be a good girl, be a good boy. Right? Don't do something bad that embarrasses us, yada, yada, yada. And rather than do something like that, rather than try to call them to keep a commitment they can't keep, rather than setting them up to fail and leading them to a life of depression and discouragement, we figured it would be far better to simply say, we know the thoughts we think toward you. You are our treasure. You are our child. We love you and that will never change. There's nothing you can do to change that. And so we give them that ring. When we are sealed, 
in Revelation 7, that picture is, you're mine. I love you. I know what I think of you. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope, and that will not change. That's a relationship with God. The mark of the beast, it's evil, and it's given to those who rebel against God. The mark of believers, it's good. And it's given to those who believe in God. The mark of the beast is a sign of people rejecting Jesus Christ. The mark of a believer is a sign of someone who's accepted Jesus Christ. The mark of the beast is a mark of slavery. And the mark of a believer, that's a mark of a relationship. When we have a relationship with a living God, it is a freeing thing. We are set free. How are you marked? Every single one of us is marked. How are you marked? When I was in junior high, I went to private school, and I had the blessing of an amazing teacher. He was Oxford trained, and he was from Jamaica, and he had a funny accent. He wore sometimes bright clothes. And his name was Othaniel Alexander Oakley. And he changed my life. He's the first Christian I ever met. He's the first person who loved Jesus Christ who ever had any involvement in my life. And though I had him for one year, he left a mark on me. Facebook has some good things. It has some bad things. One of the good things is sometimes you get connected with people in your past. I get a friend request from a person who's a musician in Great Britain. And I didn't recognize who she was, and I realized, oh, that's so-and-so. I went to eighth grade with her. Then I get a message from somebody who's a lawyer in Southern California, and I thought, I don't know who this is. And I look closer, oh, that's so-and-so, eighth grade. Yeah. They grew. They grew. I start getting all these messages from different people, and eventually we all become friends on Facebook, my eighth grade class. And as we're talking, we begin to share stories, and every story came around to Othaniel Alexander Oakley. And all of a sudden, somebody just throws out health, wealth, and character. When health is lost, something is lost. When wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When character is lost, all is lost. Something he taught us in eighth grade. We started sharing with each other all these different things that we had learned. This lesson and that lesson. Remember that time when he said this? Remember that time when he did that? Remember that time when he ripped up all of our homework assignments? Every one of them because we did not put a black band around the assignment that was exactly one half inch. He had told us. One half inch, not one sixteenth more, not one sixteenth less. And he went and measured it. This is our first day of class. First person, I mean, everybody, straight A students, first person sees it, he looks at her, rips the page, drops it on the ground. She burst into tears. I thought, oh. Next person, next person, ripped them all up, drops them on the ground. I thought, this guy's crazy, right? Now, everybody in the class is thinking about college, at eighth grade, and everyone's thinking, my life is over, it's ruined, I just got an F, right? And he did it for this reason. You are here to learn, not for a grade, and you're here to learn how to and follow instructions. Guys, this man did not just teach us about science and literature. He did not just teach us about math. He taught us about life. And we all commented eventually as we had this whole big conversation from all across the world, we all commented, it is amazing to consider that one man having less than one year, nine months he had with us, has changed our life. One man for nine months changed my life. And I, like everyone else that's ever sat in the class of Othaniel Alexander Oakley, went back when I graduated from school to become a pastor. I went back to just talk to him and to tell him what I was doing in my life. 
And when I walked in, he remembered me. Well, of course he did because I was his favorite. (laughs) But he remembered me. And when I stood at the door like we all had to do and knocked, and he looked over, he said, Ah, Mr. McCormick, you may enter. And I walk in, he stops the class, he introduces me to the class, he tells some things about me. I was amazed that he remembered. And he said, what are you doing? And I shared with him what many had done before. I shared what I was doing. And I shared that I was married, and I had kids, and I'm a pastor. And he smiled and he said, I am not surprised. This man had an impact on my life, and it took nine months. That was it. I've been a Christian since 1990. And that man, Jesus, has changed everything. He changes everything. Guys, he frees all addictions. He frees us from all depression. He fills us from any loneliness. He ministers to every one of our needs. If we all could have someone in our life that could have an impact on us, how much more? Could the God of the universe who created you recreate you? How much more could he fill in every single void, every single lack, and change every single fault? We simply present ourselves to him, and he does a work that no one else can do. He marks us. We are his, and because we are his and carry his signet, we look like him. We'll start to talk like him, and people will see us less, and they'll see him more. And through us, like the 144,000, he can change the world. But it starts with us allowing him to have control. When he has control of our life, he will move right in, and he'll make changes. What's different about the person that God uses? They are marked by God. Number two, notice I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. That's speaking of joyous praise. They are marked by God. Number two, they are attentive to God. Notice again, it says, I heard the voice from heaven like the voice of many waters. Ezekiel, speaking of the voice of God, says in Ezekiel 43, 2, his voice was like the sound of many waters and the earth shone with his glory. Revelation 1, verse 15, speaking about Jesus, his voice was a voice of many waters. Revelation 19, verse 6, speaks of something really interesting. Because in Revelation 19, verse 6, it says, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and the sound of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Why do I share these verses? Here's why. Because three times in Scripture, it describes God's voice as the voice of many waters. In Ezekiel, it's the Father. In Revelation 1, it's Jesus. In our passage we have here in Revelation 14, it simply says an unnamed voice from heaven. Sounds just like the Holy Spirit to me. The spirit of humility, who doesn't take glory for himself, but always magnifies the Son. Three times... A heavenly voice is mentioned, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in Revelation 19, it's speaking about believers, us. It's speaking about us. That there is a a voice of many waters, a sound of thundering, as multitudes of voices are doing what? Sounding just like their God. Why is that important? Because if we're going to reach a world that is hurt, that's broken, that's lost, that's damaged by sin, we need to sound like Jesus. We need to sound like God. We need to speak with truth, and we need to speak with love. They need to hear both. We don't just tell them nice things because we want to make them feel good. That's not truth. But we don't beat them up. We're not harsh. We marry both, and we speak with truth and love. And the only way for us to sound like God is for us to be attentive to God. We need to get the word of God in. We need to get the whole counsel of God. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. 
It takes every single one of these words in our heart to shape us into the men and women that we need to be so that we can be safe to minister to a world that's sick in sin. If we want to be used by God, if we want to be the person God uses, we need to be marked by God. Those that are used by God, they're attentive to God. Thirdly, they are thankful for God. Notice verse 3. It says, They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures, and the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. We need to be thankful to God. We need to acknowledge what he gives. We just celebrated Christmas not that long ago, and of course at Christmas time we give gifts. Lily gave a a gift that was really sweet. I believe it was to Mark. Um, She gives her own gifts sometimes. She even spends her own money. I don't know where she works, but she (laughs) gives a lot, and it's Really sweet. Here's an eight-year-old who wraps her gifts and and presents them to to the person that she loves with intentionality. And she gave him a spinner, you know, one of those little things that you spin. And this is what she said. She goes, I thought you could use one to relieve your stress. Because you guys know that that's where they came from, that they came to relieve stress. I thought, how sensitive is that? Mark looks like a stressful guy. So she gives Mark a little spinner, and now he looks less stressful. So what does he do? Well, he says, thank you. In fact, it was more like, oh, thank you, because it was so sweet and so intentional. Listen, everything that God does is intentional, and everything that he does is good. When's the last time you thanked him? The person God uses is marked by God. The person God uses is attentive to God. The person God uses is thankful for God. You say, but my life is filled with difficulty. Well, God says in Philippians 4.4, rejoice in the Lord always. But you don't understand, my life is miserable. It goes on to say, again, I say rejoice. It's an interesting passage. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Why? There's a need to remind us sometimes to rejoice because when we are told to rejoice, we oftentimes have a reason to say, I'm not happy because of this, and this is why I'm not rejoicing. And then God says, rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Ah, again, I say rejoice. Okay. (laughs) I guess I'll have to. James puts it this way, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete and lacking nothing. What that means is, as much as we hate to say it, the difficult times in our life are necessary. The difficult things in our life produce something good in us. Here's the part you don't like, and I don't like either. Difficult things, trials, and suffering are a gift. You're like, that is a gift I want to re-gift. Right? Hey, I I have some suffering for you. (laughs) Can you imagine if we could do that? I would do it. (laughs) I'm not perfect. I would do it. I'd give away my suffering to you to bless you. That's how much I love you. George Mueller said, the only way to learn strong faith is to endure great trials. And that's a fact. We will have trials. What's different about the person God uses? They're marked by God. They are attentive to God. They are thankful for God. They are passionate about God. Notice verse 4. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And so if you are a person that's going to be used by God, then you need to be passionate about God. Okay? Now, I have to say this. As you look at this passage, ladies, it's not saying that you're bad. Because notice verse 4 says, these are the ones who are not defiled with women. If you leave that alone by itself, it almost seems like it's, you know, adult cooties. You know? These are not defiled women. It's talking about, about defiled with sexual immorality. So these 144,000 happen to be men. It's, of course, not saying that there's anything defiling or polluted about marriage. It's saying sexual morality. 
we need to be different than what's around us. We need to be unique. We need to be separate. We need to not be a part of the world and the things that are polluting. That's what we need. And how does that happen? The hard part is, is that we can focus on not doing this, not looking at pornography, not having, you know, illicit affairs, not being sexually immoral, not doing all these other things. In fact, you can add non-sexual things and say, we can focus on not getting drunk, not partying, not, you know, having revelry and not speeding and not doing all this other stuff. We can focus on all that stuff. Or we could just simply be focused on Jesus and all those things go away. It's simple as this. Listen, it takes a passion to conquer a passion. That's it. If we have a passion for Jesus Christ, we won't want those other things. Does that make sense? How about this? Last night, I'm finishing up my message, I come home. I walked from church to our house, and it was cold. I walked inside. It was warm, it felt good, and all of a sudden, I just felt hungry. It was late. It's time for bed. But I felt hungry. And as I walked by the table, there's Mark and Rachel. They're getting married this year. It's exciting to see them sitting there talking, just kind of enjoying their love. And Mark happens to have a box of chocolate-covered cherries. And I looked over, and I thought, and they were sitting there by themselves. He was neglecting them. And I had hunger, okay? Now, I should have gone to bed, but I had hunger, okay? And he wasn't eating his cherries. And so I looked over, I go, what's that? I knew what it was. But I wanted to kind of feel it out and just feel if, if he was going to share or if he was going to be selfish, okay? And so Mark goes, well, they're, they're my chocolate-covered cherries that somebody gave me. I thought, And he didn't do anything. And so I, I said, are you going to eat him? Well, no. Oh, boom. Okay. And so I took them, and I had one. And then I had two. And then I had three. And then they went to bed. Mark went home. Rachel went downstairs. And I was left alone with the chocolate-covered cherries. And we got very close. I ate every single one of them, okay? Why? Because it became a passion, okay? But had I been full before I walked in, perhaps, munching on a bag of kale chips and being totally full when I walked in, and I saw the box of cherries, but I was full with kale, I would not wanted the box of cherries, Okay, I would have still wanted the box of cherries. <laughs> Meaning you have to find a passion greater than the passion that you have if you're wanting to switch passions. Jesus is a passion that nothing else can compare with, and when you pursue him with everything you have, you don't want anything but him. Simple as that. God will use those who are marked by him those who are attentive to him, those that are thankful for him, those who are passionate about him. And lastly, you'll use those who are ambassadors for him. Notice verse 5. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they were without fault before the throne of God. This is who we are to be. It's not about what we do. Ambassadors aren't people that are known for what they do. Ambassadors are known for whom they represent. We are known for representing Jesus Christ, and if we magnify him everywhere we go, by the words that we speak, God will use our life. But we have to magnify him. Simply put, James says, out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursings, my brethren, these things ought not to be so. If our mouth is sharing over here dirty jokes and our mouth is sharing over here crass speech and the same mouth is speaking the gospel, that's a message that won't be powerful. We have to have lips that are dedicated 
to glorifying God. Lips that speak truth. Lips that speak with grace. Lips that speak with love. Lips that speak what is pure. If our lips are going to bear the sweet name of Jesus and the wonderful message of the gospel, then our lips need to be dedicated to him. Amen? Okay. So, what's different about the person God uses? They are marked by God. They are attentive to God. They are thankful for God. They are passionate about God. They are ambassadors of God. Let me reintroduce you as we close to those same four people we talked about at the beginning. Once there were four people named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody who wanted to see change. So everybody said, I want change. Somebody said, if only anybody would start a change, I would follow. But nobody said, I will change. Sadly, everybody stayed the same, blaming somebody for wanting, or wanting anybody to start changing. So nobody changed. I look at it like this. Nobody is made to be less than. Nobody. Anybody can be used by God in a radical way. Everybody has a reason for being alive. Will somebody say, God, use me? Will somebody say it? You see, Second Chronicles 16, 9 says, listen, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro, searching about the sons of men, looking for one whose heart is his, that he might show himself strong on their behalf. Do you see that? He is looking for somebody to say, I'm here. I want to be used. I'm here. I want my life to matter. I'm here. Use me. Would you stand with me?